So our panel, Regenerating Land, Community, and Food Systems, mirrors mycelium and the ecosystem services that it provides across the landscape. And mycelium is an underground network of mycorrhizal fungi that with its tendrils connects plants and helps to transport water, carbon, nitrogen, and other important nutrients and minerals um, across the landscape. It all begins with the soil. Healthy soil supports a healthy society. And by supporting healthy soil, we are simultaneously protecting and healing a myriad of other essential cycles, including the water, air, and biodiversity of our planet. Most important, soil carbon sequestration through agriculture is now positioned as one of the most prominent methods of climate mitigation. The need for regenerative agriculture is becoming a necessity and a responsibility in a time of climate and community health crises because the industrialized food system is not sustainable. Up to six pounds of soil is destroyed for every pound of industrial food produced. And this industrial food system is responsible for close to 37% of all greenhouse gas emissions. The regenerative farming model provides a resilient framework for agriculture because it builds climate resiliency through the method of carbon drawdown. And this is done through responsible land management and the prioritization of soil health. Regenerative agriculture utilizes the power of living systems to restore the natural benefits of ecosystems. It also provides a focus on humane animal agriculture and the social well being of everyone involved. However, the practice of regenerative agriculture on its own is not enough. The following MEM projects shared in this panel provide the holistic, systems based approach to thinking about regenerative agriculture and our food system. So starting at the ground level, Kara's project focused on regenerating soils, and she did this through mentoring a group of young agrarians in the process of growing nutritious and climate smart produce, and then distributing it to the local community in, the, in an accessible way. But even with her positive impacts on the local food system and the land, she's just one producer that's looking at her farming practices through the lens of the health of land, the people, and the ecosystems. And in order to build robust communities, we're gonna need more land managers and more land owners to view their practices in the same holistic way. It's gonna take a lot of farmers and ranchers and the support of their communities in order to do this. My project sought to um, build some of these connections between producers and then also create better communication pathways between um, educators and professionals in the regenerative agricultural field. Um, part of uh, another part of this um, food system or larger system here is that relationship between uh, producers and consumers. And so Molly's project really sought to strengthen and more localize those, those relationships between them. And she also sought to find the barriers between communities getting more locally and regeneratively um, raised food um, from local farms to local plates. So like those underground, underground mycelium networks that connect various components of earth and life systems, our project panel weaves together a few critical layers of a holistic food system. From localized rebuilding of healthy soils and food production practices on a single farm, such as the one Kara developed, and the reconnecting of producer networks that Lily facilitated in order to share and spread such practices to as many farms as possible. And the distributional systems that I looked at, which brings that food from such farms to consumers like you and me. All in all, our three projects collectively engaged with more than 500 Colorado growers, landowners, and consumers, connecting the dots of a full and cooperative system. Our vision for the future is that work such as ours will improve opportunities for growers, improve access and availability for consumers, and expand food producing landscapes that are healthy, resilient, and improve the state of our climate and environment. We hope you enjoy hearing about the work that each of us have done. We thank you for being here and being part of our network and our local food system at whichever level or levels you engage with it. And so, now our awesome colleague, Kara Williard, is going to kick us off with her story of the Glacier Farm Project.
Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me here. It's been an amazing journey. My name is Kara Williard, and my MEM project was the Glacier Farm Project, modeling conservation through agriculture. This is a project that I took from concept to a reality in a little over a year and a half through project design, planning, and implementation. Glacier Farm is a partnership project between Mountain Roots Food Project and the Crested Butte Land Trust. This project was reignited as COVID-19 impacted supply chains, particularly when it came to food access here in the remote Gunnison Valley. Glacier Farm is located south of Crested Butte at nearly 9,000 feet elevation and is situated on the historic Nikolai Homestead. The goal was to meet immediate community food needs and the task was to start this farm from the ground up. A quick timeline of the progression of this project looks like in the summer of 2020, Mountain Roots and the Crested Butte Land Trust partnered up as Mountain Roots brought me on as the Glacier Farm Fellow. I spent that winter crop planning and infrastructure planning for the crop production space and the partners applied for a GOCO Great Outdoors Colorado Communi uh, Resilient Communities Grant and we were granted it and this allowed me to manage the hiring process of five seasonal Farm Corps members. We also applied for an NRCS EQIP grant to help address resource concerns on site. In May, we broke ground, which included doubling the growing space, building 550 feet of perimeter fencing, and planting the first seeds of the season. For 18 weeks throughout the growing season, Glacier Farm contributed to the Mountain Roots CSA and the Mountain Roots Backyard Harvest Food Relief Program. In fall, as the growing season slowed down, we pivoted to constructing the NRCS High Tunnel. And once the growing season concluded, I pivoted to making rec recommendations on a master plan and providing a five-year outlook into the potential of this space. The mission of Glacier Farm is to model conservation through agriculture. And this highlights the Crested Butte Land Trust's mission of protecting open space for wildlife, vistas, recreation, and ranching, and Mountain Roots' mission of cultivating a resilient food system in the Gunnison Valley by enhancing healthy connections between food, earth, and the community. In alignment to Mountain Roots farming practices, I implemented the following at Glacier Farm to build this system of regenerative agriculture, including low-till to no-till farming, a focus on soil health management and annual soil testing, uh, intensive crop rotation between heavy and light feeder crops and nitrogen fixing crops, annual cover, cro uh, annual cover cropping to help restore nitrogen to the soil, an emphasis on young farmer education and the belief that robust local food production can build community resiliency. So the goals of this project related to my MEM project were number one, to demonstrate proof of concept with, uh, with community engagement and improved environmental health at Glacier Farm in its initial year of production. And this goal was measured through monitoring land health, ensuring a successful season with the farm team that had an educational focus the implementation and closeout of the GOCO grant cycle, the tracking of volunteer hours, labor hours, and then the training and rotational hours of our farm core. Goal two is to meet or exceed projected yields in order to build Glacier Farm as a food resource in the Gunnison Valley and to contribute to the larger food hub development goals within Mountain Roots. And this goal was measured through crop planning in order to meet initial production goals, doubling the farm production production space and protecting the crops, <clears throat> harvest and distribution logging for everything produced on site, and the successful completion of the NRCS high tunnel to further bolster yields in upcoming growing seasons. And lastly, I looked to deliver a usable, feasible master plan for both partners to use as a guiding document for ongoing food production and other site development. So our outcomes related to food production, we produced a wide variety of crops including cauliflower and broccoli, this larger than my head, it was awesome. Um, all of this resulted in 3,000 pounds of food produced, which was 50% higher than my initial projected yields. And all of this was distributed to the Gunnison Valley community, 37% of which went out through Mountain Roots Backyard Harvest Food Relief Program, which is a free food program for those in need. Our outcomes related to land health. So between year one and year two, we saw an average of 43% increase in soil organic matter within the growing space. We implemented the practice of no bare beds, which means 
The beds are always either in food production or cover cropped, or when they're put to the rest for winter, we actually do a really deep mulch on them. And this helps to lock in soil moisture and build soil health over time. This last growing season, around 30% of the beds received cover crop, which helps return nitrogen to the soil and will prepare about 1,650 square feet of bed space for this upcoming growing season via these uh, winter killed cover crops on the growing space. And all of the beds on the west end of the production site were uh, planted in cover crop in fall of 2020 prior to going into food production as well. So our outcomes related to season extension, as you all may know, um, the Gunnison Valley receives less than 55 frost free days per season. And so expanding the season is a huge resource concern in order to be, in order to be able to produce food on a local scale. And so through the NRCS EQIP, we are able to construct a 26 foot by 72 foot high tunnel. And this season extension space not only helps to expand the season both in spring and fall through quick successions of cold tolerant crops. It also helps to expand the variety of vegetables that can be grown to include things such as squash, tomatoes, and bush beans. And this provides 1,800 square feet of protected growing space, um, which is set to almost double overall yields in future growing seasons. And this was a really incredible construction process. Um, so we had it approved by the partners. I built out a construction plan and then once the growing season winded down a bit, we pivoted to constructing the high tunnel, which first uh, <coughs> required digging 40 holes through two feet of bedrock. And this was quite the feat for the farm team, but we finished this in uh, late fall and it was approved by the NRCS. And so I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who participated in this project. Um, our outcomes related to the farm team. So I brought on the five seasonal farm corps members and they worked May through October. They um, joined alongside the Mountain Roots Farmer Apprentice Team to build the 2021 Mountain Roots Farm Team. And collectively, this farm team uh, worked on a rotational schedule between the community farm at Cold Harbor Institute and Glacier Farm. But then Jennifer Dews, the community farm manager, and myself built out a rotational schedule that also featured a lot of time with other local agrarian experts in the Gunnison Valley, including Susan Wyman at Gunnison Gardens, Iola Valley Farm, Calder Farm, the Western Organic Skilled, several days doing conservation work with the Crested Butte Land Trust. They got to learn from multi-generational ranchers <clears throat> such as Bob Nikolai and Rudy Rosman, and all of this resulted in 800 hours spent learning from other uh, agricultural experts and uh, seeing different methods of cold climate food production. So as the growing season winded down, um, we pivoted to reporting on all the metrics tracked, especially as we closed out the GOCO grant. And then I also pivoted to recommendations for a master plan to build out future goals for this site in alignment to the partner uh, missions. And these recommendations included integrating animal agriculture in the form of pastured poultry, um, providing a workshop and agritourism component on site in future seasons, I revisited a tree planting grant, which would provide a windbreak on the west side of the property, um, which was originally applied for in December of 2020 with the Colorado Tree Coalition. And this would certainly help with crop production. Um, looking at options for wildlife habitat planting and perennial planting, which is a current part of the NRCS EQIP grant. And there's other further expansion of that NRCS EQIP, which would be helpful to the site, including practices such as rainwater catchment. Um, I looked at different op options for on-site building renovation because there's several historic buildings on site, which could include an educational field office for the Crested Butte Land Trust or a potential farm stand in future years for uh, showcasing and selling local producer goods. All of this was put into a cost benefit analysis to look at potential revenue with some of these recommendations, as well as the associated expenses with implementation. So the potential five-year results uh, upon implementation of this plan, Glacier Farm could potentially hold 40 individual agrarians um, as far as providing a space for them to learn from and contribute to the local Gunnison Valley food shed. Over 100 individual volunteers and 1,000 volunteer hours could occur at Glacier 
based on the last two summers average of about 200 volunteer hours. If the workshop and agritourism series were to be implemented, this would potentially host 240 attendees over the next four years. And as far as land health results, Glacier Farm will continue to see an increase in land health via the soil test results uh, based on the regenerative practices outlined in my master plan. Um, as far as food production results, based on a rather conservative estimate, Glacier Farm could produce 22,500 pounds of food over the next five growing seasons, and all of which could be distributed to the local community. If 50 pastured chickens were to be raised per year, this would result in another 1,250 pounds of organically raised pastured poultry. And overall, Glacier Farm will continue to contribute to Mountain Roots' vision of a resilient and local food shed. It was an incredibly successful first season at Glacier Farm, and I look forward to seeing this partnership project continue to grow and flourish and produce food for the Gunnison Valley. And I would like to acknowledge a huge network of people who shared this journey with, uh, with me while building Glacier Farm and who have taught me so much throughout my journey in graduate school, including Holly Kahn, Jake Jones, Cheryl Swellick, Jennifer Dews, the 2021 Mountain Roots Farm Team, Molly Maisel, Dr. Michael Russell, my graduate mentor, Western Colorado University's MEM faculty, Bob Nikolai, Alicia Rummel with NRCS, Great Outdoors Colorado, the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild, my friends and family, <clears throat> Zach Houston, my partner, and the Gunnison Valley community. And I acknowledge that the land I farmed on and learned on, learned from for this project is the traditional territory of the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. Thank you, everyone. And now I'll bring Molly Maisel up. Uh, she's gonna talk about how all this food gets distributed. Oh yeah, sorry. I'll take questions now, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it does both. Um, so the question, the question? was, <laughs> The question was, does the high tunnel expand the variety of food that can be grown or does it just extend the season? And it does both. So in an ideal world, we would put in a like, quick succession of cold tolerant crops in the spring and fall. And then in the heart of the season, you'd be able to produce some more heat loving crops that are otherwise very difficult to grow outdoors in this climate. Um, so that could, it might this year look like a lot of peppers and bush beans, but also like tomatoes, squash, things like that. Thanks. Yeah, Davis. Yeah, good question. So the question was how we are uh, measuring the increase in soil organic matter. And as far as the future of this goes, um, I've kind of like refined the plots that should be exactly, uh, the soil should be taken from each season. Um, but between the two years, it was like an average of five different test sites, um, seeing really low numbers in the first year, and then where the, cover, where the bed space received cover crop and then was planted in crops and amended with compost and everything else within that one growing season, it was an average between those two sites. But now that we have kind of like defined plot sites, it'll be a little bit easier to track like in, you know, exact bed A to bed A kind of things year to year. Yeah, and it just, um, it all came out of a, the soil testing results just that we sent off to the lab. Yeah, thanks. William would like to know, is there a way to make the food grown at the farm affordable to low-income local communities? Great question. So the question, oh no, I guess you just read it into the mic. So, um, so that is one of the most, uh, I think that's one of Mountain Roots like strong suits is really not only producing this food, but finding ways to distribute this food in ways that is more equitable and accessible um, to low-income communities. So I think Mountain Roots has several programs that have done that really well, including the Backyard Harvest Food Relief Program, which is where 37% of the total food produced at Glacier went out, and that went out for free to vulnerable community members. Um, but then there's been other initiatives as well, such as they just got, um, SNAP benefits accepted 
and things like that. And so I think ongoing mission within Mountain Roots and a lot of farmers in this valley is trying to find ways to get this food to um, people who need it. That's all the questions we have for, or have time for right now. Thanks. Thank you. And now we'll bring Molly Maisel up to talk about food distribution and food hubs. Thank you, Kara. So again, I'm Molly Maisel, and I'll be sharing today about the Southwest Colorado Local Food Connectivity Project. I wanna start by setting the stage. Southwest Colorado is a vast region of rural open space, high mountains, desert sage, and lush river valleys. Agriculturally, some areas in the region support warm climate farms and orchards for long growing seasons. In other areas, growing seasons are much shorter, but cool climate crops such as leafy greens can be abundant in the height of summer. Our region is economically diverse as well. Amidst wealthier ski towns, we have more than 10 census tracts that are classified as low income or low access. And in many instances, our areas with the most abundant agricultural food supply are not well connected to our areas with the highest market demand or the greatest need. Across the region, demand for locally sourced and sustainably raised food has been on an upward trend. And to meet this growing demand, over the past 10 years or so, a handful of local food hub enterprises have emerged in our region and they're acting as business intermediaries between producers and consumers in our region. And while this is great, our regional food connectivity is still not quite at the level that many local food actors would like to see it. Those food hubs are not yet effectively or efficiently exchanging product amongst each other. Many producers are expressing interest in being able to increase their production and reach new market channels. And consumers are consistently asking for greater product variety and improved accessibility. This project has conducted a region-wide needs assessment and planning initiative that's centered on stakeholder engagement. Our goals were to better understand the greatest successes and challenges working for and against regional food business and look for opportunities to break down barriers and improve the efficiency, viability, and equity of our regional food system. The project was collaboratively conducted by six local food organizations in Southwest Colorado and in two tiers or phases for entering the project. In tier one, being part of it from the beginning has been Mountain Roots Food Project here in the Gunnison Valley, my community sponsor, and the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition. These are two areas that had not yet been yet connected via regular trucking routes and product exchange, and so the planning work started here. Then in the tier two, entering the project in a later phase has been farm runners in Delta County, Guidestone, Colorado, Chafee County, and the Good Food Collective and Southwest Farm Fresh in the Four Corners area. And as for me, it's just been an honor to have been able to co-develop and co-direct this project on behalf of these organizations. The methodology of the project was strategically laid out over the course of more than a full year and in four distinct phases. We started with a local food economy needs assessment in the tier one partner areas. This was focused on three main stakeholder groups, producers, wholesale buyers such as restaurants, grocers, and schools, and individual consumers. It involved the widespread administration of a survey, but also a series of stakeholder roundtable conversations that were designed to facilitate open dialogue, experience sharing, and brainstorming around opportunities for our food system. This all happened well ahead of the busy growing season so that during the growing season, we could conduct a pilot program to test drive some strategies identified during the needs assessment. After the growing season, the needs assessment process was replicated in the remaining four network partners areas. And finally, all of the data gathered was analyzed and documented into a set of recommendations for moving this connectivity work into future implementation. Now a little bit more about the pilot program. So here we tried three main strategies. The first one was all about connecting the Gunnison and San Luis Valleys. 
Now the San Luis Valley already has an established food hub, but without an established bulk market in Gunnison, it didn't make sense for them to simply create a new trucking route here. It's about a nine hour drive over a mountain pass. And so with our tier two partner, Farm Runners, our three entities formulated and tried out a truck backhauling strategy in which the Farm Runners truck passing through Gunnison to exchange product with the San Luis Valley would save room on the truck for Gunnison goods to go to the San Luis and then bring some San Luis Valley goods back for delivery in Gunnison on the return trip. Now this kind of coordination certainly takes more time and effort by all parties involved, but we found that with proper planning, this method has the opportunity to move more product around the region without adding more gas emitting trucks to the road and reducing the inefficiency of having empty trucks on the road, mostly on their return trips. Also in the pilot program, very briefly, here in Gunnison, we launched an online local food ordering platform to encourage more ongoing and consisting sales during harvest season. And our last strategy was all about marketing and consumer education. And for this, we coordinated and co-hosted a two-day Gunnison Valley Regenerative Farm Tour in which attendees visited seven different local farms, got to know their local farmers, including Kara Williard, and ended their tour at the Gunnison Farmers Market to do some shopping. So after a whirlwind year, our project team gained a lot of new insight and connections, which all went into the final phase of the project, that planning for future implementation. And with that, the major deliverable of this project is what we call the Roadmap to Regional Connectivity. It's a 14-page document of eight critical factors or recommended action strategies to move this work into the future and for use by local food businesses and organizations. I don't have time to read you the whole roadmap, but you can find it on the website of Mountain Roots Food Project as of last week. So for today, I'll just run through each of the eight factors and give a couple of key tidbits of information around each one. Here we go. Number one, relationship building is the first step. At the top of the lessons learned, we witnessed firsthand that local and regional food system actors are stronger together. And we recommend that efforts always be made to strengthen partnerships and collaborations between all actors, producers, food hubs, consumers, and so on around. Number two, food hubs or nodes are needed in each locality. Some areas in our region lack a dedicated facility for aggregation and distribution of local food. Of producers we talked to, those who were already selling through a food hub as one of their market channels were generally reporting higher revenues than those not yet selling through a food hub. On the other side, 87% of wholesale buyers we talked to reported that they would prefer or do prefer ordering in a food, from a food hub in a one-stop shop method versus multiple orders from multiple farms. This map simply shows in blue the areas in our region that have an existing food hub, and in red, a couple of key areas that currently lack one, but we feel could support one and would benefit from one's creation. Number three, local food retail outlets are needed in each locality. We heard over and over that a once weekly farmer's market is not enough. Consumers in our region want local food shops that are open seven days a week, including evening hours, are close to their home or work, are easily accessible regarding parking, public transportation, and bike friendliness, and very importantly, they accept food benefits such as SNAP. Once again, on this map, just a couple of key areas are highlighted in red that are currently lacking such a retail outlet we feel could support one and would benefit from one's creation. Number four, commercial kitchens and processing are needed in each locality. Among other considerations here, we heard from some buyers such as school districts that they would like to purchase more local food and would do so if they could get it in more processed and ready to use form. Number five, improved logistics and transportation and inventory are needed. It became very apparent to us that logistics experts are needed to create a regional transportation strategy and to support coordination between existing food hubs. Number six, product availability, accessibility, expansion, and diversity are key. There's a lot going on under this one, so I'll just highlight one key concept and that is collaborative crop planning between local producers. 
This could reduce the unnecessary competition when many farms are harvesting the same things at the same time, and also increase opportunities for aggregating like items to meet larger wholesale order needs. Number seven, marketing has room for growth. Most farmers we talk to want to spend more time farming and less time marketing. Consumers are hungry to know more about their farmers and about their farmers' practices. All stakeholder groups we talk to are excited about agritourism events such as farm tours and farm to table dinners, which create meaningful connections between producers and consumers. Number eight, consumer education must expand. Consumers in our region want to receive more recipes and cooking tips for using food that grows in our region. Producers also want consumers to receive those things as well as know a host of other things, including but not limited to the true cost of food, the fact that many producers in our region are making wages at or below the poverty level, and that many of them are producing food in ways that is beyond organic and regenerative, despite lack of certifications, which are often costly and time consuming to get. To cover both seven and eight, consumer education and marketing, our roadmap suggests the creation of dedicated regional food marketing staff to work on all of those things. And I'll finish back at number one, relationship building. Of all things gained through this process, perhaps the most important has been it strengthened the relationships between six local food organizations in our region that are dedicated to sustainable agriculture, regional food connectivity, and moving this work out of the planning phases and into the implementation stages. And with that, I thank these people so much, the leaders of the organizations, including Holly Kahn with Mountain Roots. These are the visionaries behind this work. And I must also thank a host of other people who've made this work possible and supported me along the way, including numerous MEM faculty and staff, thank you, Kate, Members of this community, including those with the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild, Mountain Roots Farm Managers, Kara and Jen Dews, Kara Willard and Jen Dews, my family and friends. And lastly, to the 300 and plus stakeholders that, involved, that were involved with our needs assessment process and to the funder of our work, the US Department of Agriculture. Thank you all so much for listening. Take any questions now or after. I just So the question was for two years, how does this work? The, the past work, the planning project be sustained? That's a great question. So funding is a big one. I will say this planning project was going to happen whether it was an MEM project or not. Um, and thanks to the, the USDA grant. So now I know those, the organizations involved are applying for more funding from the USDA and other sources to get some of those items in the roadmap, we hope up and going over the next three to five years. So it takes funding, it takes people, um, but those organizations, the six have been involved with this project are committed to moving this work forward. And I really hope to see some big moves there and hopefully there are opportunities for more MEM projects if possible. Thanks for the question, Jess. Any others or? The question was how did climate change factor into conversations with producers? So uh, I know not with all of them, but with many producers, um, climate change is a big thing on the radar. There are a lot of them out there. I'll say those here in the Gunnison Valley with the Producers Guild, I believe they're all doing sustainable and regenerative agriculture work. And so climate change is, is very important. Um, not all farms are, you know, the bottom line is important, but I think having, you know, programs that make it more viable to have such businesses by making the food more affordable, accessible can help make those transitions. 
But climate change, I will say, was not the main focus of our roundtable conversations and focus groups. It's very important to some and not so important to others. And it's one of those spectrum things. I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. Did I see one more hand? Two more hands. Emily. The question was, were these six organizations that did this project together, were they already talking or was I the one who connected them? It was completely not me. They were already talking <laughs> and had applied for and received this grant to do this planning project first. So I think that's a, a great thing. You know, um, it also speaks to, to Dr. Young's question over here that this work is, it's already happening, which is exciting. I was lucky to be given the position to help guide the project a little bit, but they were already doing it, which is a cool thing. Thanks for the question. We'll have to save the last questions for the panel discussion, but thanks. Thanks everyone for your questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Lily for the final presentation of the day. Woo! This is the fun part. So my name is Lily Richards and my project focused on regenerating rangelands and ranching communities um, through the rebuilding of the Colorado Regenerative Network. So first I'll start off with the problem statement that my project helped to address. I'll introduce the Cold Harbor Institute and the Colorado Regenerative Network, and then walk you through the four phases that my project is broken down into and the cumulative products that came from these phases. And lastly, the next steps in my project scope. So for many decades, the agricultural sector has been facing a great challenge in an increasingly variable and unpredictable climate. And the way that ranchers and farmers practice their land management has a direct relationship to their ability to address this challenge. And it's essential to attaining widespread health of land, livelihoods, and ecosystem resilience. Um, there lacks a pathway for producers to really connect with one another and share knowledge and practices, and then um, to gain support from experienced practitioners. So my project sought to create some of these connections and pathways. As you've heard, the Cold Harbor Institute is a local nonprofit here in Gunnison, and its mission is to demonstrate and share uh, best regenerative living practices. And um, it does so very well on its 334 acre ranch outside of town. Um, among its many land uses that this property holds, one of them is um, to graze holistically managed and regener regeneratively raised um, hogs and cattle. So from this really strong regenerative bedrock, the Colorado Regenerative Network was born. Um, in 2017, the Cold Harbor Institute began, began a path to become a savory institute accredited hub and the Savory Institute is a global network with the mission to restore the world's grasslands through holistic management. Holistic management is a set of tools, principles, and a decision-making framework, um, which seek to provide a more inclusive, robust, and overall whole way of viewing certain situations such as land management, agricultural practices, businesses, et cetera. And so with the partnering of these two, um, the CRN has a mission to expand regenerative practices into statewide practice and consciousness through collaboratively and synergistically focused work in the Colorado region. The CRN has been um, working towards this mission with its um, co-hub leaders, the Parker Pastures. They've been on um, their holistically managed uh, cattle and sheep operation here in Denison, and they've been providing uh, educational opportunities and courses to those here in the Gunnison Valley. Uh, with, the, with more interest arising in holistic management and regenerative agriculture, 
uh, the CRN kind of lacked a capacity to really provide true continuing support and education for um, agricultural producers. So with this need in mind, I created four um, project objectives. One to create an online network to house, an online platform to house this network of producers, create a membership framework to understand who our audience members were, and then have curated courses and content to address um, the levels of the membership net framework, and then to, in the end, increase educational capacity. So my first phase was to do some research on online platforms that are out there. And I first talked with the CRN leadership team to create a um, shared vision of what the CRN could look like in order to use that as my scope as I did research. So I did a comparison of six different platforms uh, based on certain attributes that were going to be valuable for the CRN, including price and um, discussion board opportunities and and a few others. And with this, I did an overview and presented it back to this leadership team with my recommendations in mind as to what was gonna be the best fit for the CRN. And um, afterwards, we were able to have a really great discussion and choose a platform to move forward with, which is exciting. Phase two looked more towards outreach and engagement with uh, current CRN audience members and uh, potential ones. My colleague, Sean McGrath, and I planned a one-day soil health workshop, which sought to share this valuable topic with our community members and local landowners and um, agricultural producers. So we brought in a few different speakers to talk about soil health from different angles, including what it looks like, agricultural practices that can help to increase it, and certain programs that are happening in the state of Colorado right now that will support um, producers in, in increasing their soil health. So we had 10 attendees in person and seven virtually. And I uh, provided a survey at the end to get a lot of feedback on how they felt about the topic and if they learned a lot and what they wanted to learn more about, which was uh, really helpful for this project. This kind of leads into phase three of evaluation and surveys. So in order to create curated content, um, I wanted to find out what producers were needing the most information and help with. I created a survey that I circulated to a CRN contact list and then um, distributed it at the Western Colorado Food and Farm Forum. From these two efforts, I garnered 12 responses, which did provide a lot of valuable information and there was a lot of overlap, but also some new spots of concern for producers and what they need help and support with. And so this will greatly inform the content that the CRN is providing through its courses. Uh, phase four was um, the actual restructuring and, and reinventing of the framework of the CRN. Um, this began with an opportunity for myself and the, lead and the CRN leadership team to take part in a 16 week hub design lab through the Savory Institute. And this is just an opportunity for reflection about how we're providing our services and um, we've been able to re-envision our holistic context, which is just our values, our purpose, things like that. And then our structure, which is how we provide these services as well as the roles of the individuals involved with the CRN. So all of these phases culminated into two larger products and I really like metaphors. So. Um, these products kind of act as that like groundwork or under the ground work that seeds do before they can become sprouts and break over the service. So this is just like the foundational work for the CRN to move forward. The first of these products is a framework for relationships. So this honeycomb here um, represents the nodal style relationship that the CRN would like to have with its partners. And this broadly includes agricultural producers, um, Savory Institute educators, and then other service providers who might help us with marketing, event planning, monitoring of lands, and then any holistically managed properties that would like to be part of demonstration or learning sites for our educational um, courses and offerings. And then partners and clients such as the Savory Institute, Parker Pastures, and other local, local and regional holistically managed operations. And then lastly, people who are just interested in learning more about holistic management or supporting the mission of the CRN. 
So kind of paired with this is this content format framework. And um, I determined a few channels for which were gonna be best for us to provide this information and education. And then based on our feedback and surveys, there are four broader topics that the CRN is going to be able to provide to its producers. And um, it just kind of shows the relationship of how that content can be grouped together in certain ways to really meet our different levels of producers where they are in their agricultural journey and experience. The second of these products is a business model canvas. And um, this is just to create, you know, the CRN is about education and support, but it also is a business. And so to be able to create a shared language of how we're going to provide these services and what services we're going to provide um, and putting it kind of all out there um, is the purpose of this. And then when CRN um, leaderships, leadership members are making decisions in the future or uh, redirecting, the, the, um, redirecting the purpose of the CRN, they can kind of run that decision through this structure and determine if it's what the CRN, um, in line with this, what the CRN wants. And then lastly, um, this is a process that is still in the works, but it's more action-based. Um, I started a holistic management comprehensive course through the Savory Institute back in February, and that puts me on the track to becoming an accredited professional with them, which just allows me to teach hol um, accredited holistic management courses and then to train, consult, and support producers in the region um, through the Savory Institute. And so I've learned about holistic financial planning and uh, livestock grazing planning, and um, that process is still ongoing. So where can the CRN grow from here? First, I'll be able to complete this holistic management comprehensive and then be be able to become an accredited professional and provide services for the CRN, which will increase its educational capacity. And I look forward to hopefully increasing the acres of holistically managed and regeneratively grown food and uh, livestock within, the col within Colorado. I also recommend that a whole season of courses and, and offerings be planned out to kind of line up with the growing season as that's the best time to present some of these principles and information so that people can actually see them out on the land and see the, the benefits and everything. Um, and then to launch the online platform. So kind of all this base work has been done about who the audience members are going to be and, and all those kinds of things. And so it just needs to be input into a platform and launched. And then online course content creation is sort of with the planning season so that all of that information will be kind of recorded and then create and then put into online courses. And then lastly, a plan for outreach and growth based on the success of these preceding steps. And then I'd just like to thank um, MJ Pickett, the executive director of Cold Harbor, Dr. Melanie Armstrong, my mentor, the Cold Harbor Institute from, and Ralph E. Clark for my fellowship supporting my master's project Hannah Schaefer Tibbetts, Mill Creek Ranch, and my family and friends. I'll now take questions. Yes, Hannah. Yeah, so uh, I just feel like uh, regenerative agriculture is kind of at this tipping point of really just widespread, um, widespread practice. And so I'm excited to kind of be a part of that and hopefully help to really push it towards that. Um, I think that ranchers and far generational ranchers and farmers and other people interested in the environment have really seen the negative impacts that um, land management through one lens has had on, on uh, people's livelihoods, on the soil productivity, things like that. And so I'm just excited to be here during this time where I feel like it's about to um, kind of really take off and could really benefit the, the landscapes and, and the people involved with that. Yes.
So the question is whether I received any pushback from more conventional producers on these new new practices and kind of a new way to do things. Um, I personally have not, and um, I, I would say that my project wasn't as outward facing as maybe my next experiences will be. And so maybe that's, maybe that's coming. Um, I can say that um, I read a lot of, there's, there's research about, um, you know, how producers need a lot of support and, and connectivity, which is, you know, the importance of this project in order to um, kind of take a chance in switching their practices. And so um, I know that uh, change can be very scary, especially when your livelihood is tied, tied up in those practices and, and those changes. And so while I have not dealt with it yet, I know that um, I try to just come from a place of understanding and that um, there could be a lot of different ways to do things um, and that it can be scary to try something new when your livelihood's tied up. We will now move into the full panel Q&A. To begin, Matthew on Zoom has a question for the entire panel. Can you please share your perspective on what a fully realized Gunnison Valley food shed looks like in five to 10 years? He also says there's no right answer. <laughs> yeah, I think it would consist of a lot of like bolstering of support of our already existing producers. And then that would hopefully encourage more producers to come on the scene. I know I have aspirations of farming, but like being a young farmer has always felt like there's a lot of barriers to entry. So trying to kind of address some of that. Um, and then I think a lot of what Molly's done, um, because we realized that Gunnison Valley only has a certain amount of food produ producing capacity. Granted, there is a lot of new like technologies that um, can expand the growing season or even produce food 365 days of the year, such as hydroponic systems and things like that. So I think it's an integration of some of those new technologies, but also a uh, more realized uh, regional food system as well and being able to build that connectivity which I think Molly has done an amazing job of. Um, so I, I feel like I'm more geared towards livestock and ranching versus the farming aspect of it but um, ranching is a very big thing in the Gunnison Valley and so I think my vision for the next five to ten years is just to connect more of them together to these holistic holistic management and regenerative agriculture and um, to support them and maybe becoming a little more localized. There's a huge barrier to um, meat products in particular being more localized because it is a very high cost to do local, um, the local processing. And so there's like four main processors. Um, it's, a, it's a big monopoly on the meat industry. And so finding ways to support them becoming more local through kind of more localized processing and um, figuring out how to lessen the cost for them somehow and kind of make it even out more for them to be able to provide their, their um, products to, to the community. Yeah, I echo everything that has already been said. And so I think just kind of the big pieces are, are being more resilient. You know, what if those trucks do stop running? What if supply chains fail? Just having, you know, it is about, I say supply and demand a lot, um, but, you know, being able to support farmers, making farming a viable business so that growers can, you know, earn a good wage doing it. And so that young farmers can enter farming and it can continue. And it also means support, you know, community support, of locally sourced, sustainably raised goods. And the part of that too is accessibility and affordability. It must be more affordable and easy to access for all income levels. And that means, you know, more acceptance of food benefits like SNAP, you know, um, most producers, for example, that I spoke with in our needs assessment, they're, they're not 
um, set up to be SNAP retailers, it's kind of, you know, a process to apply for that. So if, you know, it's another opportunity to work through a store or a food hub that, that does accept such things. Um, and it's a, it's a problem with the government subsidizing unhealthy foods, right? The big industrial soy and corn. So if we could just kind of shift and get more dollars flowing to producers who are doing it well and making it a viable business, you know, more supply and demand here in Gunnison. We have another uh, question on Zoom. Joe Laverini is curious if you see an opportunity to connect networks in Western Colorado. For example, as a public land manager, I would love to network more with the agricultural community in the valley to cross pollinate our ideas. Do we need to build a bigger tent to tackle these challenges? And if so, how? He also says <laughs> he needs help figuring out what to do with all those radishes in his CSA. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an important conversation because um, these conversations around regenerative agriculture do need to kind of take a holistic approach and like how they can integrate with other um, movements. So that was a really, I think, interesting part of my project is kind of taking agriculture through the lens of conservation and trying to understand how um, some of the conservation values can be modeled through agriculture. And so I, I think there is a gap in how some of those conversations and connectivity uh, are currently happening, but I think there's a lot of need there and um, I would love for more networking and connectivity among different movements. I wasn't at attendance at it, but I heard that the um, Crested Butte Community Compass had brought together land management agencies and conservation groups with, with ranchers. Um, and I think those conversations, I don't know what exactly happened there, but I think that just needs to happen more. It's like, we shouldn't be working in silos. Um, we don't, sorry, we don't have a better answer for you, Joe. Um, and my favorite way to use radishes is just slicing them up and putting them in a salad, maybe pickling them. I think that was part two of the question. <laughs> Hi, Joe, and thanks. And Jeanette? So the question is what advice I would give to a young farmer or a first generation farmer. And I think first, um, I would say don't be overwhelmed. I've spent like the last 10 years farming at a variety of different operations from larger production, urban production operations to small permaculture farms. And I think the common thread is there's always a lot to do, but if you kind of go about it with like sort of a project based mentality and you have your goals, you can just kind of slowly tackle piece by piece. I think um, just leaning into the network and kind of remaining humble as you just every day are humbled both by the land and the, the farmers that have been doing it so long, you know, they know the natural phenology of how everything occurs throughout the growing season. And it's just kind of like a lifetime of learning and abundant ever infinite knowledge to know and so I think if you can kind of just take it little by little and not get overwhelmed um and you know reach out to your community really reach out to the people who do it well and um you know I think it's really easy to get into farming like there's so many opportunities farmers always need help and so you know it's an abundance of uh opportunities but then as far as like actually taking the steps to owning your own farm or things like that. That's a whole nother pursuit and that can be a little bit more difficult, but thanks for the question. We have another question on Zoom. Um, Hannah would like to know, how will you make inroads with generational farmers and ranchers? Can you repeat the question? How will you make inroads with generational farmers and ranchers? Inroads? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have been uh, working on a ranch here in Gunnison for the last year and 
uh, trying to build relationships through just getting to know people and having experience with, experiences with them and understanding things from their point of view. And I think that that's what I will continue to do. Um, I'm actually not really a people person, but I feel like <laughs> in the right setting, I, I do like to make connection and make people feel heard and supported. And so I think that just continuing to, um, you know, push myself outside of my comfort zone and, and try to meet these people is going to be how I do that. So thank you, Hannah, for that question. Yes, Butch. Um, the question was whether any of us have tried or whether we know of any attempts to uh, reach out to indigenous peoples and figure out what sort of foods they were eating when they were here. And I can say that I'm, I'm not sure. of any. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I can't speak to that here in the Gunnison Valley. I'm new to farming in this valley, but I'm a multi-generational New Mexican. And I think a lot of what I learned and how I grew food um, in New Mexico was completely based on indigenous indigenous knowledge. And that said, I also want to like pay tribute to any of these concepts of sustainable or regenerative agriculture because that is just innate to um, indigenous knowledge that their farming and agricultural systems were inherently regenerative. And so I think there's a lot of like new age buzz around these words, but that um, you know, these original agricultural practices were regenerative in, in their own and on their own right. So thanks for the question. Will you, oh, are you, sorry. <laughs> I'll just add really briefly. Um, we had um, a great partner in our um, collaborative for our project, the, the Good Food Collective in the Four Corners area, which is really involved with the Montezuma Food Coalition. I might have said their name wrong. Um, which are really well connected with um, BIPOC communities in the, the Ute Mountain Ute um, area and the, the Navajo Nation as well. So I know we had a bit of engagement from, from those groups in our needs assessment. Um, and as far as particular crops, I know that they've just got, you know, some, there's some great farms out there doing, is it Arrowhead doing the grain um, kind of in the Four Corners region? So bow and arrow, thank you, is the farm down there. So there's um, I can't speak exactly to older traditional things, but there's some really great um, farms out in that area. That's a really great question. William would like to know, can regenerative farming utilize the same large scale planting and harvesting technologies or does it require different techniques? <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of really large scale regenerative practices being applied to animal agriculture and it's being implemented across like pretty large scale operations um, as far as cattle grazing and things like that. I think there's still some efficiencies that could be improved upon like crop product uh, crop production. Um, but that as a whole there is it's kind of like if you have a full system of efficiency um, from start to finish of a certain crop, you can do it regeneratively, especially if you're you know doing large scale cover crop and just keeping um, crop rotation and things like that in mind as you scale up into larger operations. And that's like a bow and arrow, um, which is on, it's a Ute Mountain Ute Tribe farm. They do a lot of large scale production corn and they just have, you know, cover cropping and really intensive crop rotation on a really large scale. Um, so they are protecting soil health even while scaling up into larger operations. Any yeah. other questions from the in-person audience? Uh, the question was, 
how do we see being able to include the immigration community in venison with with these sorts of projects um i think that just getting getting the information out there and um letting them know that we're wanting to bring them to the table um cold harbor institute has recently been going through its educational content and getting it um, translated into spanish and so i think that being able to offer this information in different languages is very important and then um, to your point that yes, they have a lot of, of not a lot of knowledge um, from their own experiences. And so I think to um, maybe just be better at, at facilitating that and um, letting them know that we, we would like to have them at the table. Yeah, that's a, a great question, Ricardo. Thank you. And I think a big part of it is land access. Um, it's not easy to obtain land. And I think so I've been inspired by some, um, we worked extensively with the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition and they have a program, it's an incubator farm program specifically for immigrant communities, immigrant families to have access to farmland uh, to support themselves, but also sell that food as a business. Uh, and I think that's a really cool model that would be neat to bring here, just maybe having a way to access gain or lease land or have kind of incubator programs to bring in more communities that are having more barriers to accessing land to farm on. That's a great question. And I just think the other component is food literacy, but that's not like a one-sided relationship. I think there's um, a lot of like reciprocity that can be shared from like how different crops can be used and then trying to integrate different crops into this area that might be um, more familiar, but that, you know, it's, that conversation goes both ways. So it's not just like us producing what we can um, and telling people how to use it, but also being open to other ideas and other methods as well. Thank you. I'm going to have this panel sit tight for just a moment because we can all think about how hungry we are and how much we want to get out in the sunshine. Thanks for ending the day on a food panel. Um, but I wanted to give everyone here today a moment to uh, thank their faculty members who have worked so hard to mentor them in this project work. And I know there's a lot of time and investment from our faculty, as well as there are so many community partners in the uh, audience with us today. So let's hear a little bit of thanks for the faculty and community partners for their work. It's been an amazing first day. I can't imagine uh, the, I can't believe that we're just one day in. There's so much that I've already learned and so many things that we still have yet to learn over these next two days. We invite you to gather back here, same time, same place tomorrow morning, 8.30 um, here in the auditorium. We have another full day of presentations and we're really looking forward to continuing these conversations. So please do join us then. And now I'd like to congratulate our newest Master in Environmental Management students. Let's start with Molly Mazel down on the end. Lily Richards next in line. And Kara Williard, congratulations. Congrats to all of you and enjoy your evening.